Welcome to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. Later in the show, we'll talk with Mansell Nelson, Program Manager of the Indoor Air Quality in Tribal Communities, Tribal Environmental Education Outreach Program, Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University, and Sydney Hunyuti will tell us about her Instagram page, Native STEM Women. But right now, Lonasha Puati talks with Jeffrey Lazos Ferns and Blaine Archer about the upcoming 2023 Arizona Indian Festival in Scottsdale. I'm host Lanasha Puati. Jeffrey Lazos Ferns is the communications director for the Arizona American Indian Tourism Association. And Blaine Archer is the Director of Business Development at Soul Surgery, and they are here to talk to us about the upcoming 2023 Arizona Indian Festival. Hello, Jeffrey and Blaine. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Hello. Thank you for having us. Hello. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This is, this is a pleasure. And before we get started, can you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves, where you're from? My name is Jeffrey Lasso's Ferns. I'm a native Arizonan. Um, I've been working with the Arizona American Indian Tourism Association for about seven years in communications, and I also produce other events for them. Um, The festival uh, is in its ninth year. Um, The uh, is being held in downtown Scottsdale, and I'm excited to talk more about it. My name is Blaine. Thank you for that, Jeff. I've been with Soul Surgery going on six years now, and we're an inpatient treatment facility located in North Scottsdale for substance abuse and mental health. It's a pleasure to have you both today. To get started, can you let us know more about what is the Arizona American Indian Tourism Association and what is Soul Surgery, and how do these two entities intersect? Great. Well, I'll start. Um, So the American Indian uh, Tourism Association was established in 1994. And what we do is we promote tribal tourism uh, for all 22 recognized tribes. In addition, uh, our focus is the health, wellness, uh, economically and sustainability for young entrepreneurs um, with tribal affiliation. The intersection for us in soul surgery, which I'll let uh, Blaine expand on, is that we focus on the health and wellness uh, economically through tourism and promoting uh, entrepreneurship for tribal natives. And Blaine, uh, from a holistic perspective, can share with you what soul surgery does. So we're both working on the health and wellness platform, but at different uh, intersections. Yeah, so soul surgery um, was created at the end or established at the end of 2016, and we have the the mission of the mind, body, and spirit. So we try to approach substance abuse and mental health and more the holistic approach. So we have sacred soul, right? So we have a native specific program that's been around for about six months now and one of our uh, one of our doctors uh, dr robbie he's our chief medical officer so he's a naturopathic when it comes to um, certain kind of medicines and the modalities and the approaches that we use when it comes to treating individuals and yes so like we are a big component on the health and wellness you know for individuals and that's what we try to you know distinguish the difference between us and the other um treatment centers in the valley as we try to approach it in more of the the holistic aspect. Oh, wow. That is awesome how you can both come together um, and do that. Can you guys let us know more about the upcoming festival and why was it created? So the the festival, um, we we do programs throughout the year, the Arizona American Indian Tourism Association. The festival was created um, in response to the the, uh, visibility in uh, Scottsdale, the center of Scottsdale. We bring all 22 uh, tribes together in one location. It is in addition to a tourist-based event. We also have about 70 native artists there this year. Um, But what I do year round is work with media and press and journalists with the Arizona Office of Tourism and Experience Scottsdale to educate the media and the public on the diversity of uh, tribes, their own language, their 
you know, arts and crafts, their customs and stuff. So this culminating event is our big event in year where throughout the year, all these people are invited together from the media, the press, tribal leaders and stuff to bridge uh, communities, but also to distinctly share with the general public all of these beautiful indigenous communities that are their own sovereign nations. And in addition, through their language and their food, we're able to um, promote these different sections. And there's a tourism base to this, too. So a lot of tribal communities like Shanto and, and Chapters and Hopi and Autumn people are there promoting their own tribal tourism elements on the reservation outside of the big, uh, um, you know, general Arizona thing they go really deep into if you tour Santo, this is what you'll experience and here's our contact. So it really is our biggest marketing media event all year. We're fortunate because Soul Surgery's commitment uh, to tribal communities, they came in as partnering with us on the festival and economically has helped make this festival possible this year. And can you um, elaborate where and when the festival will be held? Yes, yeah, so the festival is held February 4th and 5th in uh, the brand new renovated uh, Scottsdale Civic Center. We're the first event in there for the public this year. Um, it's held on a Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 4 p.m. in downtown Scottsdale. And most of our information relative to artists, artisans, how to get there, where to park, is on our website, ArizonaIndianTourism.org. And what kinds of activities and programs are planned? So the festival, um, we have full stages running from 10 to 4. We have uh, stage representation um, from most, if not all, of the Native communities. We have the uh, sacred ram dancers coming from the Wallapai, the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We have... uh, uh, traditional singers. We have contemporary Native artists. In addition, 70 artists representative of uh, uh, Arizona tribes. We have food, um, the tourism elements. So if you want to figure out how to tour off the beaten path in uh, s- some remote tribal destination, we have representatives from those uh, communities there. Um, so just overall, a very vibrant, bright uh, festival. In addition, we have uh, community allies and members like Soul Surgery and tourism based there is an office of tourism and uh, nonprofits working alongside uh, health and wellness of Native communities will be there as well. And can you let us know or tell us some more about how the festival provides a platform for tribal tourism and awareness of Arizona's indigenous communities? Sure. So um, year round, uh, we are uh, comprised of a volunteer board of nine uh, uh, tribal members from different regions. And we promote Arizona tribal tourism destinations federal or locally and nationally. We're also part of the Arizona American or national organization of tourism basing. In addition, uh, when media reaches out uh, looking for that native story, Um, especially around uh, tourism or food or culture, we're that resource which then uh, connects that media outlet to that entrepreneur or that tribal liaison or uh, that destination. So a lot of good programs there. We uh, work as a conduit uh, for visibility for tribal lands and communities and entrepreneurs uh, doing great things in uh, Indian country. And the festival usually has a good outcome. Do you know how many attendees attended the festival last year? Yes, last year um, we've had probably, I think, close to seven or 8,000, and that was a pandemic year. Um, the, this festival is the weekend before Super Bowl. Um, ESPN is doing live B-roll at the festival to promote uh, the native aspects of Arizona for national broadcast. So we're expecting anywhere between 10 and 17,000 people this year. Oh, yes, that's amazing. And I saw on your webpage that tribal royalty is expected to make an appearance as well. Do you know um, which tribal courts will be attending? 
Yes, we, we work very closely with the uh, Royalty Association and uh, Miss uh, Indian Arizona, her court, and usually we get pretty good representation um, from most of the tribes, including the northern and southern tribes. So I would say anywhere between you know, 7 and 15 royalty will be in attendance. Awesome. And do you know how many um, Native American vendors you are expecting? Because I know you mentioned you have 70 Native artists, but also you are providing food as well. Yes. And anybody vending uh, or um, as part of the festival um, in terms of uh, arts and crafts have to be uh, federally uh, recognized uh, tribal members. So our vendors are 70, our uh, food, there's about four or five different food elements to that. Um, and then, of course, all the entertainment and the programming and stuff. So it is 100% native in regards to that. And is there anything um, either one of you would like to add about the festival? I'd like uh, Blaine to expand on this. They're going to be at the festival and we're excited to be there with them. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, like Jeffrey said, we are going to have a booth set up there as well um, for the event. And it's going to be educational. It's going to be informational. Obviously, we work with some of the local tribes here in Arizona. And what we want to do is we want to spread awareness when it comes to substance abuse and mental health. And we want to be able to expand you know, people's resources. And we want to be able to expand... Um, when it comes to improving our communities, right? We want it like, like we're all about the holistic approach and the mind, body, and soul. And just, we just want to spread the awareness and help as many people as we possibly can, right? And kind of um, lend a hand right now because with the world right now, when it comes to substance abuse and mental health, it's not getting any better. It's just getting worse. So that's what we're here. We're just here to be part of the change. And if I could uh, uh, end with the, um, if, if you're going to attend the festival either day, uh, especially on a sat on the Saturday day, the uh, Western Week is going on. We're part of the Western Week program for the city of Scottsdale. Uh, the Parada del Parade is going on, as well as the Trails End Festival, walking minutes from where we're at. So please uh, look at our website and prepare your day in terms of parking and getting there Um, because there's literally going to be tens of tens of thousands of people in that central location. So uh, plan your trip. Uh, Join us. It's a festive. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, stage production. Um, You'll see things I haven't seen before. So I'm always excited by that. But I want you to please plan how you're going to get there and when you're going to get there, because that part of Scottsdale will be pretty congested that day, especially with a lot of Super Bowl visitors um, flying in, and they used to come in seven to ten days before the festival. So we'll probably see a lot of them at the festival. Oh, yes, definitely. sounds like it will be a very um, big festival and um, a great event. Can you let our listeners um, know where they can go to find out more information about the Arizona Indian Festival and how can they contact or who can they contact for further questions? Sure. Um, so the uh festival website is is arizonaindiantourism.org there's a festival link there with all the information including how to get there Um, and then a for more information you can click on the link on the website and it'll direct that uh, to me and I will respond uh, quickly to get you uh, the information you're looking for. And I would like to thank you both, Jeffrey and Blaine, for taking time out to talk to us today to tell us more about the great festival. And Blaine, thank you for sharing um, what you will be providing at your booth as well. Coming up, Lanasha talks with Mansell Nelson. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health, with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health provides primary medical, dental, behavioral health, WIC, and wellness services for the urban Native American community. 
For more information, call 602-279-5262 or visit our webpage at nativehealthphoenix.org. Native Talk Arizona returns after this song. You are listening to Breath of Water by Big City Indians. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. Mansell Nelson is the program manager of the Indoor Air Quality in Tribal Communities, Tribal Environmental Education Outreach Program, Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University. Hello, Mansell. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to a conversation with you. And before we get started, please tell us about yourself. Well, I have been working with the Institute for the last uh, 25 years as an educator. I served in the military as a chemical biological officer, and um, the military also gave me my engineering training. I have uh, four adult children and six grandchildren. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And thank you for your service, Mansell. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about the NAU's Tribal Environmental Outreach Program? Sure, I'd love to. Um, We have several components to our program. One of the things is we try to work with all ages from pre-kindergarten up through communities and adults. And uh, so we try to cater our programs to a variety of ages and situations. We even have a a family math and science program we like to take to communities to help them be more aware of how science and math can benefit uh, their children's education. Um, We do have an internship program as part of the, the education and outreach and And I also work with tribal staff to help them with their outreach efforts in their communities. 
Oh, wow, that is awesome. And、uh, can you tell us about how the innovative, fun, and creative ways you are engaging students to show how mathematics, science, and technology can be applied to understanding local and global environmental issues? Certainly.、Um, I mentioned the family math program, and one of the things that we work on is helping students realize that. Math and science can be fun.、Um, so, we think that's part of helping students feel comfortable with、um, learning about and being involved with math and science. But、um, really, much of our work is focused on helping students to understand、um, that math, for example, is useful. It, we can use it to describe the natural world.、Um, we can Collect information to help us understand, for example,、um, water quality or,、um, in our case, air quality.、Um, so it helps us understand our exposures and how it might impact our, our health.、Um, and we do that primarily through working with students in an activity、um, oriented way,、um, introducing them to. The instruments that scientists might use. So, if it was、uh, water quality, we'd introduce them to pH meters and conductivity meters and、um, the kinds of tools that scientists would use in the field.、Um, for air quality, in similar fashion,、uh, we introduce them to the various air quality meters and、um, teach them how to use them. And then we conduct investigations. So, we actually、um, do science while we're learning about it. We try to make it a service learning opportunity where the information they're collecting might be of value to the community itself, perhaps to the school administration.、Um, the last several school visits I've done, we did an indoor quality assessment of the school building, collecting lots of data. And we compiled that data and presented it to the school administrators, with, along with recommendations on things that they might want to. Change to make their school a healthier place. So, we try to work on things that actually matter to students, that impact them, and give them opportunities to have a voice、um, to make contributions so that、um, they're actually acting as a scientist. And、um, I know you mentioned that you work with families from. Children from pre K all the way to adults. Why do you think it is important to engage、um, children, youth, and adults? Well,、um, a large part of our focus is、um, encouraging students to consider environmental careers. And I know working in the communities that we work in, which is predominantly tribal communities, that it really takes the support of the entire family for. A student to be willing to to leave home and to go to college.、Um, it's a lot of work. It often involves some financial support,、um, but perhaps even more important is the emotional support from the family、um, for that student to succeed. So we know it's a family effort.、Um, it's not just a student deciding that what they want to do and then being able to do that all on their own.、Um, We encourage engagement from the family, and we want the family to understand why it's valuable to study math and science. They themselves may not have had a good experience with that. So, we want them to understand that science、um, can be beneficial and useful to the community as well as to their individual families and students. And、um, earlier you had mentioned that the outreach program or your programs offer i n t e r n s h i p Can you tell us more about the internships you offer? Yes.、Uh, we have、um, basically three different internship programs that I can share. One we call our short internship program, which is, as the name implies,、um, usually just 40 to 80 hour project. Um, even do that with high school and college students engaging in、um, a project, sometimes of their choice, sometimes a, a tribe needs help with.、Um, we like them doing real work,、um, preferably working with 
um, scientists or technicians in the field to accomplish something useful as well as to learn uh, about it themselves. So that's a way of getting um, a spectrum of students across many different uh, time frames. Um, then two other programs that are more oriented to the summer. One is in air quality. Um, we encourage students to sign up for air quality projects through the summer and they can be with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, with tribal um, governments, with nonprofit organizations working on tribal issues. Um, so a wide variety of possibilities for the students and they work on those projects throughout the, the summer. And then our third program is our land and water. Um, and by the way, the air quality one is funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. The land and water is actually a group of private foundations that came to us and wanted to expand our internship program into land and water. And um, similar to the air quality, it's a summer program. The students sign up for a project to work on for eight to 10 weeks. Um, this particular program is oriented to the Colorado River watershed area. So the seven states where the Colorado River runs, um, about 40 tribes are in that region. And we focus on those tribes, but we also work with government agencies and universities in that area to place the students working on, again, real projects that will benefit those tribal communities. And how long has the ITEP internship been around? Well, ITEP started about um, 30 years ago, just a little over 30 years. And our founder was recognized uh, the vital need to provide opportunities for students to um, pursue careers in the environment. So um, the internship program was founded within a few years after that, so about 27 years ago. Um, I've been involved in it now for about 24 years, um, either supervising the person who's responsible for it or doing it myself or just helping out. Um, it's been uh, a great opportunity for me to be involved with students over those 24 years, and many of them have become colleagues that I continue working with. And who is eligible to apply for the scholarship, and when is the deadline? For the internship, it's um, the deadline for the air quality one is coming up in a few weeks, February 8th. Um, the land and water internship program will be um, about six weeks after that. It doesn't actually have a date yet. Um, but uh, as far as eligibility, uh, we're primarily focusing on our indigenous students, our Native American students. So um, probably a certificate of Indian blood. And then um, college student basically in good standing with their university. And can you um, tell us more about the internship process? Sure. So we, um, we recruit the host sites and we recruit the interns. So every year is different as far as what kind of projects we have available. But um, I recruit nationally, so from coast to coast and Alaska. Um, and then I advertise the projects that are available and the students can sign up for which ones they're interested in. So they can sign up for several opportunities with one application. Um, the host sites actually conduct the interviews and select the intern they want to work with. And then we do the hiring. So they're actually um, an NEU subcontractor and we place them with the with the host sites. So the host site does the supervision and we help out with um, basically logistics and payroll and that kind of thing. Oh, that's awesome. And do you have a favorite success story you can share with us? Yeah, I think, well, I've got many favorites. Like I said, uh, some of these folks 
um, do an internship and then become a colleague that I work with. In fact, um, this week I was in Las Vegas and one of the folks I was working with there is a former ITEP intern and now he's a director of one of our ITEP programs. Um, so it's always gratifying to me personally to to have interns that I've worked with become colleagues. But I think one of the interesting ones that I had recently was a student that was concerned about the air quality that his family was being exposed to. Um, he lives not too far away from one of our freeways here in northern Arizona. And he had heard that living close to a freeway um, degraded your air quality. So um, he talked to me about it, and I offered him the opportunity to conduct his own research project and gave him some instruments to do that. And so he was measuring air quality outside, inside. And um, as I had predicted, he actually found out that some of the activities that he was doing in his own home um, degraded the air quality more than that highway did. Um, so he learned some important things about um, keeping his family safe and healthy. And um, I'll be working with him to actually share that with with others because that's an important um, message for people to hear. But he was able to figure that out himself using the instruments and collecting data and recognizing um, where where he could make corrections to improve his air quality. Oh, wow, that is great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and finally, how can our listeners learn more about ITEP and how can they contact you if they have further questions? I'd encourage uh, using my email, which is my name, uh, mansell.nelson at neu.edu. Um, also, our website, which if you just Google NAU, ITEP, I-T-E-P, um, it'll be the top link on Google probably. And um, I'm all over that website um, as far as the different programs I run. So if, for example, you're looking for the internship program, you'll find uh, my email and my phone number and things like that. So probably the simplest way is just to remember Google NAU, ITEP. Perfect. Well, I'd like to thank you, Mansell, for taking time out to talk to us today to share all of this great information about ITEP at NAU. Well, thank you. I like getting the word out um, since we're a national program and we're trying to serve the 574 federally recognized tribes. Uh, we like to get the word out to everyone and have opportunity to serve as many of those communities as we can. Up next, Sydney Hu UT will tell us about her Instagram page, Native STEM Women. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health, with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road, and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health family advocates can help you enroll, renew, or update your access information. This can be done in person, on the phone, or via Zoom, days, nights, or weekends. It's fast, easy, and can make a difference in keeping your health care coverage. For more information, call 602-279-5262. Native Talk Arizona returns after this song. You are listening to Fight Like a Girl by Ray Zaragoza. Sing our 
Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puati. On the phone with me is Sydney Hanyuti, creator of the Instagram page Native STEM Woman, encouraging Indigenous women to follow their passion in anything and everything STEM. Welcome to our show, Sydney. It's an honor to have you on our show. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us where you're from and about your indigenous heritage. I am a senior computer science major at Harding University. I'm from the village Kikoksmovi, Arizona, and I'm part of the Spider Clan. And um, I forgot, I'm also part of the Hopi tribe as well. Can you tell us more about what is Native STEM Woman? Native STEM Woman is an Instagram Instagram page that is meant to encourage other Natives, primarily women, to be exposed to or be connected with other people or events in the STEM field. And to help our listeners out, can you tell us what is STEM and STEAM? Like, what are they? Yeah, STEM and STEAM are very similar to each other. The only difference is that STEAM incorporates art with STEM. And the art portion is meant to integrate soft skills, and those soft skills are concepts and practices of the art. Examples of these are data visualization or coding AI art. And what, are, what do they stand for? Um, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And STEM is the same thing, science, technology, engineering, and the A is art. And then, again, M for mathematics. And can you tell us um, about why you started Native STEM Woman? Yeah. So during the midst of COVID, just like most universities, my school shut down temporarily. I had a lot of time to myself, and I always had a calling to help others, especially those in my community. That's when I decided to create an Instagram page to help those to help expose the younger generation to STEM. I chose Instagram because I knew that's what the younger folks were using and figured that's what be, that would be the fastest way to reach everybody. Um, in the beginning, it was hard to reach students, whether in high school or college. So I made it more broader and it became an encouragement or exposure to not just students, but to other individuals who aren't in the STEM world. And how did you get interested in STEM? I got interested in STEM during my senior year of high school. I took graphic design in my sophomore and junior year, and I was already interested in how digital technology works. So during my senior year, my school opened up a new engineering class, and that's where I was able to get exposed to coding and robotics. And with that exposure, it helped me get into my computer science major as well. Going back to Native STEM women, what kind of programs or education and mentorship does your Instagram provide? Currently, it doesn't offer anything, although hopefully in the future when it becomes bigger, I want to create all the necessary tools for students or individuals to advance in their careers in the STEM world. Right now, I look for internships, scholarships, jobs, or workshop opportunities and I post it on the Instagram story so that those with the so that those that follow the page can also see how many options or opportunities a STEM field can give someone. And the internships and scholarships that you share are they um, offered for like every? Are they indigenous focused and are they like available statewide or just specifically in Arizona? So sometimes they can vary. I try to aim for those that are out of state. Um, I know it 
I like to try to give encouragement to others that, you know, they can get out of Arizona or wherever they're in um, and explore another state. Um, it gives them more opportunities to meet others that not that aren't in their, you know, diverse pot and they can meet others likewise as them. Um, but I do also post those that are, whether if they're in Arizona, um, so it, it just varies depending on which ones that I see or who, you know, sometimes I have other, um, organizations that, that contact me to try to, um, you know, give exposure or a shout out, uh, to those. Um, that they offer, and I think an example was um, Girls Who Code. They had reached out to me to, um, you know, share that there was an opportunity for middle school students to um, do a summer program with them where they gave them free coding lessons and coding programs. Oh, wow, that is amazing. And you said that um, you started this in kind of, was it during the pandemic or at the start of the pandemic? Yeah, this was during the pandemic. Oh, yeah, okay. it was a kind of a yeah, it was kind of a scary time as well. So that also helped me, you know, release some tension off of what was happening in the events. <laughs> and how would you say um, your page has evolved since starting it back in twenty twenty? I'd say. I've been able to get more people to contact me as far as, you know, opportunities to, you know, share with the followers on the page. Uh, Before, I was trying to get followers and try to encourage them and expose them to other people who also were already making their uh, marks on the world, such as Danielle Ford. She was an ex-product worker at Facebook. So I just wanted to give a... An encouragement and show others that you know it's not just primarily men that are you know going into this field it's also other people like us getting oh. into it how many followers does your instagram have now right now it has i want to say about a thousand it, it's come a long way but i'm proud of it How would you engage people to get interested in STEM or how how do you track women specifically? I have tried to reach out to other students that I've seen that have followed me. I think a lot of them are shy. um, So I had to put myself and show um, during the summer, I actually asked, you know, if there were students who were in an internship Um, if we could do kind of like a day in the life of whatever internship that they were interning for. Um, And again, I think there was some that were shy, so I went ahead and showed what I did. I was a data engineer at USAA, and so I had, you know, just recorded myself, everything that I was doing, you know, starting from getting tea in the morning to um, kind of showing, you know, this is what we do in our daily stand-ups, uh, this is what I can show you on what I do at my internship, um, you know, just stuff like that and little nuances there, here and there. Um, but as far as trying to engage women, I try to, I try to create it to be, you know, more girly. <laughs> um, I add, like, a lot of pinks and stuff, or, um, but uh, it's, I, I'm always welcome to other to the guys as well, um, you know. So I, I I try my best. <laughs> How young were you when you first got interested um, in STEM? Yeah, uh, I was about seventeen or eighteen. Uh, like I had said, I was a senior in high school. Um, that's when I, you know, became exposed to my engineering class at my school just newly created during that time and it was my senior year um so about yeah 17 or 18 so i've met people that actually had been in this you know exposed to stem since they were five but it was a little different case for my story but you know this you're never too old to get exposed to anything dealing with the stem field and why do you think it is important to engage in um, the youth, like young girls? 
it's crucial to engage the youth because they will be our new leaders in the world. They can be the new inventors of a new billion dollar idea. Um, I know at home on the res, it can be tricky and some people can have it more complicated than others. So when we encourage the youth, it gives them purpose and more drive to chase their dreams and build a pathway for themselves. Do you have um, a favorite success story in STEM or STEAM? Yeah, actually, my favorite success story is uh, Danielle Ford. I don't know her personally. She is someone that I see as an encouragement in my school journey. Uh, Danielle used to be a product designer for Facebook. It took her 10 years to earn her bachelor's degree, but she didn't give up. She had patience and a plan, and now she is the CEO and co-founder of a nonprofit organization called Natives Natives Rising. It is aiming to help indigenous communities through tech careers and entrepreneurship. And she's, as I said before, an encouragement in my school journey. Um, And I believe she can be an encouragement to others as well. And Sydney, has science and math always um, come easily to you? It hasn't, actually. (laughs) Um, You know, math for me, especially getting into college, became a lot more complicated and difficult for me. And so, of course, through trial and error, uh, I am where I am right now. Um, But, yeah, it it can be difficult, and it's okay. You know, sometimes we don't make it the first time, but we try again, we can get it. So it can be difficult, but it's also rewarding in the end once you get through it. And do you have um, any advice to anyone who is maybe looking into a career in STEM or maybe even thinking about it? Um, Do you have any advice for them on resources or how they can reach their goals? Yeah, so I know for me what I had to do, well, originally when I became a computer science major. I didn't really have a lot of influences of or know any other people that were, um, you know, majoring in computer science. Um, So what I had to do was, you know, just Google, see what I could find. But I also had found what helped a lot was the ACES community. Um, They're the ones that help, you know, other Indigenous students get scholarships in the STEM world as well. Um, and they're the primarily big organ, uh, nonprofit organization, um, but they also have their newsletters that show different highlights of other students, but also other professionals, and they have their stories in their newsletters. And that's what helped me a lot um, to get that encouragement, because if I know that someone like them can do it, then I know I can do it as well. So just, you know, don't give up, just keep persevering, because at the end, it's going to be worth it. Oh, yes, that's definitely true. Um, and Sydney, can you let our listeners know where they can find more information about Native STEM women and how they can contact you for further questions? Yeah, so Native STEM women is on Instagram. It's all one word, just Native STEM women, all lowercase as well. Um, I have a uh, email too as well as emailing, um, if you like to email um, it's same thing, native stem women at gmail.com. You can message the Instagram account or you can email again, like I said. Um, but I also had put the email address on the bio of the Instagram page. Oh, perfect. Well, I would like to thank you, Sydney, for taking time out to talk to us today to tell us more about the native stem woman and also the best of luck on your journey and everyone's journey as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor as well. Thank you for listening to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and 90.7 FM KRDP. Our executive producer is Susan Levy. Sound engineer is Javier Quiroga, and our host is Lanasha Puadi. We hope you will tune in again next week. If you have any questions, please reach us at nativetalkaz at listen to krdp.com.